receive all the honor, praise, and glory. And Father, would you, I just love that, that lyric that was there, that your love endures through the winter rains. And man, what a great just a sentence for us to meditate on, that your love is so enduring. We might be going through these rainy seasons, these rainy times, these confusing, we might not understand what's going on, but Lord, your love is enduring. And so, Lord, your praise is going to be on our lips. We want to offer you this morning the sacrifice of praise. And so meet us here in this place. Speak to us through your word, oh God. Would you do an amazing work? Would you build us up and encourage us? So we love you. We trust you together. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you turn? Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, it is good for you to be here this morning. It is very good to be here this morning. I'm going to get this set up. I, I, I rushed through this this morning. I said, you know what? If we are going to be here in the house, I'm going to get a little PowerPoint set up so that we got everything right here on the screen. And we have a screen. Let's make use of it. So I was over there typing up. Man, I really wanted to be on the property this morning. I thought for sure it's going to clear up. It's going to be good. Yeah, well, the knowledge of man (laughs) didn't make it. But man, it's so good to be together. And I think as we started this morning, you know, I watched, I didn't watch the whole movie. I watched the clip of a movie this week. And I wanted to, I, it was so interesting to me. Do you guys remember the event? There was, I, it was, this is a documentary, a documentary movie. Do you remember the event, the miracle on the Hudson? Do you know what I'm talking about? You guys remember the, does that bring up some vivid imagery into your mind? The miracle on the Hudson, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 hits that flock of Canadian geese taking off out of LaGuardia Airport there in New York. And what happens, man, it hits this flock of geese. It's no good. The engines are both damaged. There's no thrust on this plane. Captain Sully is up there. He says, we're going to have to ditch in the Hudson. We're going to have to have an emergency landing right there in the middle of the river. And man, I saw a clip of that event, that, you know, the movie, you guys probably have seen that movie, Sully. I didn't watch the whole thing. I saw a clip, but in this clip, what really impressed me was you had these flight attendants, right? They, they, they hit these birds and there's these flight attendants that are in, in the cabin with all the passengers and these flight attendants, these stewards on this plane, what did they do? They guessed And what happened? What happened? Oh, you know, we hit a bird. Oh, we're going to go back to LaGuardia then. You know, they guessed, but they had no clue to the outcome of what was going to happen on that plane. And yet, what did they do? They calmly just walked down the aisle, you know, seatbelts, put your seatbelts on. Everybody put your seatbelts on, make sure they're fastened. And they just kind of reassured, calmly reassured everyone on that plane that everything was going to be okay. And they're just walking down. And and then (laughs) it's so interesting because Sully gets, he doesn't talk too much to the cabin. He's trying to figure out what's going on with the plane. And when he talks to the cabin, all that he says is, you know, brace for impact. (laughs) Can you imagine? You don't know what's going on. You think you're going back to the airport. The lights are going off. Everything's going crazy. You don't hear the engine. Brace for impact. The plane's going down. And what do the stewards do as the captain calls brace for impact? Well, obviously they're going to run around like crazy people and be sitting there saying, oh my gosh, we're all going to No, they didn't do that. And this is what really impressed me about these stewards on this aircraft. They didn't run around. They didn't go nuts. They calmly did their job. If you watch that show, you see, you see, you know, brace, brace, brace. Heads down, stay down. Brace, everybody brace. And they went about and they did their job. Why? They had faith. They had trust. They had confidence in their captain. Absolute faith absolute trust in their captain that he was going to do what was right. They didn't know if they were going to live or die. No one had really successfully performed an emergency landing, emergency water landing like that before. They had no idea what was going to happen. And yet they had faith that their captain, Captain Sully, was going to do what was right. And it reminded me as a Christian, as a church, that we know the end before it happens. We're studying prophecy. We know the end before it happens. We know, in fact, what will happen. And yet, what are we doing as Christians and as a church? I think maybe there's times where we might be coming preoccupied 
with these things that are going on in the world around us. We might be chasing after things over there or over there. We might be chasing after money. We might be chasing after power or likes or influence or politics, any number of these things that we might find ourselves chasing after. And guys, in the end, these things, they're not going to matter. We have to be about our captain's business. We have to be about our captain's business. Because here's the thing. Prophecy, this understanding of what will happen, should give us and encourage us to have absolute confidence in God. To have a passion for his word. To grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. To pray and to point others, this lost and hurting world that's going to hell. We need to point them to Jesus Christ. And we need to be patiently waiting on God's plan and his timing. This is why we have prophecy. We are an ambassador of Jesus Christ, and we have a requirement as an ambassador. Just like those flight attendants, those stewards on that plane had a requirement, we also have a requirement. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful, doing their captain's business, that they be found faithful. We have to be about our father's business. Church, we must be about our father's business. Why? The plane is going down. We're living in the last days. It's very clear as we look out into the world and we start to see the things that Jesus talked about, these world events that are happening in the world around us. You know, pestilence is increasing. We see wars and rumors of wars. We see earthquakes, tsunamis, all of these crazy things are happening in our world today. And then we go and look at Paul as he talks about the characteristics of the last days in humanity, the love growing cold all around us. Disobedient to parents is one of the big ones in there. I wonder if we see that today. We, as ambassadors of Christ, must be thinking about those sitting on that plane that are on the broad road to destruction. We have to be concerned about others. We have to be faithful using our testimonies to point others to Jesus Christ, using what we know of God and his word, that he loves us. I mean, his love endures through the winter rains. I mean, what a great, what a great little sentence for us this morning. We have to use what we know of Christ, using our testimonies to point others to Jesus. This is what we are called to do as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're back into prophecy. We're looking at Daniel's second vision. And with this second vision, we move into a new area of prophecy here in the book of Daniel. So if you have your Bibles, please please turn with me to Daniel chapter 8. I'm reading out of the ESV this morning. It says this, in the third year, verse 1, of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, Daniel after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. I mean, we've ended, here's the thing, guys, we have ended the section to the Gentiles. Remember in chapter two, we talked about how chapters two through seven were written in Aramaic. Why? Because that was the, that was sent out to the Gentile world. That was for the Gentiles. But now here in chapter eight, Daniel transitions from the language of the world to the language back to Hebrew. Why? Because these prophecies and the things that happened from Daniel eight to Daniel chapter 12 focus in on Israel. What is going to happen to Israel in the future? What is going to happen to Israel in the last days? Daniel here is in Susa, the citadel. Why is it called the citadel? It was the capital of the Medes and the Persians. It was 250 miles east of Babylon. And so he's sitting there as he's he's on some type of diplomatic mission. And so as he's there with the Medes and the Persians, uh, probably doing diplomacy, he has another vision. And again, he has a vision of the nations. And from God's point of view, we talked about it last week, he sees the nations as beasts. And how does he, what kind of beasts are they? Notice verse 3, I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher, and the higher came up last. It's interesting because 
the Medes and the Persians. He sees them as he sees them having these these horns. And one of these horns is higher than the other. Why? Because the Medes started out more powerful, but the Medes came up came up, the Persians came up second and became greater than the Medes. I saw, and what does he say? I saw the ram charging. Notice how he charges westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Why did he charge in those directions? Why does it say, why doesn't it say he charged eastward? Well, because remember, Medes and Persians were from the east, and so they would charge every other direction. They came from the east. And then, uh, as I was considering, so he sees this ram, he's considering these things. As I was considering this vision, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram uh, with the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns, and the ram had no power to stand before him. But he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him, and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. What we see is Alexander the Great, Greece, coming as this ram, not touching the ground. What does that signify? You have to remember, the Medes and the Persians had an army probably of over 1.5 to 2 million men, and they would bring their whole entourage with them as they went to war. Well, King Alexander's army, some people estimate it was 35,000 men, a very small army in the standards of that day. And yet they moved very quickly. They were a very, very rapid army that could move quickly. And then they used Alexander's superior strategy to, to battle as they go through and they completely wipe out the Medes and the Persians. Verse eight says this, and the goat became exceedingly great. And I want to point out something. I was reading uh, John Corson and John Corson had this quote, It says this, after defeating Xerxes, who was the king of the Medes and the Persians at the time, Alexander went on and kept going south to Israel. When he neared Jerusalem, he was poised to annihilate it when the high priest met him outside of the city and showed him this passage written 200 years earlier. So convinced was Alexander that it spoke of him that he spared Jerusalem. The city was saved because the word was shared. I think it's really interesting. You're not going to find this event in history books. Why? Because secular history believes there is absolutely no way the prophecies of Daniel could have been written before the events. Why? Because they're too accurate. No one can know with this amount of certainty future events. That's what the secular people say. They say there's no way that this was written hundreds and hundreds, 200 years before the events even happened. Why? Because there's no way anyone can know with that degree of precision the future history of the world. And yet we know prophecy to God. Prophecy to God is him telling us history beforehand. God, because he stands outside of time, absolutely knows the beginning from the end. He's standing outside of time. He knows exactly what is going to happen in this world. And so we won't read about this. But here is Alexander the Great. And what does it say about him? But when he was strong, the great horn was broken. And instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns towards the four winds of heaven. And if you guys have studied history, go talk to Giovanni. Talk to, uh, I don't know if Jim is a, is a historian of, of Greek history. You know, he he's, might specialize there in World War II. But after conquering the known world, Alexander had gone all the way into India. And after Khan, he got to India and he says, let's go farther. Let's go farther east. And all of his generals were like, we are not going any farther. Look at this. It's like jungle. We're not going any farther in this. We're going back. And so all of his guys, so Alexander agrees. And so after conquering, at that point, the known world, he had conquered everything. You know, his generals refusing to enter any further into India. Alexander the Great returns to Babylon. He has a drunken party. All these guys get drunk. He walks out of this party into the rain. And he falls asleep, soaking wet. And three days later, dies of pneumonia. 33 years old. 
and his generals, they take over the four generals. They take over his kingdom. They divide it into four parts, each one of them taking a part. And we're going to examine these four kingdoms and really two of them out there in Daniel chapter 11. You can read ahead. That's two weeks from now or three weeks from now. We're going to focus in on that. But this morning, This morning, there is one of these horns that we're really going to focus on because this horn is a foreshadowing of the Antichrist. Notice what he says in verse 9. Out of one of them, so out of these four horns, out of one of them came a little horn which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and toward the glorious land. This little horn is a gentleman named Antiochus. Antiochus comes out. He's one of these little horns. He comes from one of these one of these areas, and he starts to take over. And I love what Wearsby says about this gentleman, Antiochus. He gave himself the name Epiphanes. So everyone knew him as Antiochus Epiphanes, which means illustrious manifestation. That he is the illustrious manifestation, for he claimed to be a revelation. He is an epiphany of the gods. In In fact, a God himself. He is the illustrious manifestation. He is absolutely insane. And he sets his eyes to start conquering these different areas. And he sets his eyes, if you notice, on the glorious land, which means Israel. And so as he goes from there, what does it say? It grew great. Here in verse 10, he grew great, even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offering was taken away from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. That is a challenging passage, and I love what J. Vernon McGee says about that passage. This statement, this passage is admittedly difficult to interpret. I believe that the natural interpretation is that Antiochus challenged God and was permitted to capture Jerusalem and the temple. This warfare included the spiritual realm where angels and demons were involved. Some of the feats attributed to Antiochus are astounding if they are true. Demonic power was exhibited. We know for a fact that Antiochus was successful in conquering Jerusalem. And what did he do when he conquered Jerusalem? He outlawed Judaism. You were not allowed to worship God, is what Antiochus said. Why? Because you were to worship him. See if this sounds familiar. He sets up an image of himself. Uh, Some people say it's either an image of himself or an image of Zeus, but he says that he is the son of Zeus and a manifestation of Zeus, so it's really an image of himself. He sets this up in the temple. He goes on the altar. He slaughters pigs on the altar. He takes the pig's blood and just wipes it all over the temple. And then the leftover blood, he makes the priest drink it. This guy is absolutely insane. And so for a t- he called, he said, you have to worship this image. You have to worship me as God. You cannot worship God. If he found anyone with their Torah, with the law, they would be immediately executed. It was absolutely insane. Worship him or be killed was what was going on at the time. And for a time, this guy prospers. He absolutely prospers for a time. And here's the thing, church. This gentleman, Antiochus, is truly a picture of the Antichrist that is to come in the last days. And how long? And so we look back at this Antiochus gentleman, Antiochus Epiphanes. We look at him. How long was he going to reign? How long was the Lord going to allow him to do these crazy things, to rule, to desecrate the temple, to do these crazy things? It's very specific and very clear what was going to happen. Then I heard a holy one. Notice what, then I heard a holy one speaking. And another holy one said to the one who spoke, for how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. And if those of you with calculators, you can look, you can just type in 
300. And back then, the, it was about 360 days a year. But even with 365, it's a little over six years, if you do the math. And so a little over six years, this guy was going to, and Antiochus Epiphanes was going to be allowed to do what he wanted. And so in 171 BC, Antiochus goes into Jerusalem and removes the true high priest. And he sets up this guy, I believe his name was Jason. He sets this guy up who was actually not a priest. He, Jason had paid Antiochus money to be the priest. He says, give me this position. I want this position. And this, uh, this Jason fellow, he supported the Greeks. He supported Antiochus. He supported this guy. And so as soon as this happens, a revolt breaks out in Jerusalem. A revolt revolt breaks out across Israel, led by some of the other priests who had been expelled from the temple. And one of the families that had been expelled is these these Maccabees, and one of the sons of the leaders, his name was Judah, Judah Maccabee, and they called him the Hammer. I mean, here's this priest. And so if you get those pictures of these, they called this guy the hammer. And so he led this rebellion and this revolt against Antiochus. And so there's guerrilla warfare happening all across Jerusalem, all across Jerusalem, all across Israel. There's this crazy, it's almost like civil war. And they're fighting all of these, all of these soldiers of Antiochus. They're fighting these, these Greek Jews that have been put in by Antiochus into the priesthood. There's just these, this guerrilla warfare that's going all over. And so that begins in 171 BC. Well, wouldn't you know, a little over six years later, on December 14th, 165 BC, to the day, 2,300 days, the rebels are absolutely victorious. They drive out Antiochus Epiphanes from Israel. They drive him out. All of his armies defeated by this small rebel band doing guerrilla warfare. They drive this guy out. They drive Jason out. They drive these guys. And man, it's just absolutely crazy. And so they go in and they purify the temple. Why? Because Antiochus had put his images in there. He had desecrated the thing. You know, these these false priests were doing all their stuff. So they, they purify the temple. They purify the temple and they restore worship. Except, and this is the crazy thing. This event, this rededication of this temple is where the Jews today, and we see it today as well, where they get this festival of Hanukkah. And how did that begin? This festival of Hanukkah, this festival of rededication. And so it's really interesting. They go in and they light the candle, this lamp that's sitting there in the holy place. They light the lamp and the lamp is to give light. It's to never go out. And the problem with these guys is they only have oil for this lamp for one day. And so they're like, what are we going to do? We can't run out of oil. We need to make, you could only use the oil that was meant for the temple. And so they had to make the oil. But it took them eight days to make the oil. They had oil for one day for the lamp. It was going to take eight days to make the oil. And so they said, we're just going to trust the Lord. And wouldn't you know, the one day supply of oil, how long do you think it lasted? It lasted exactly the eight days it took them to make the new oil to light the lamp in the temple. That absolutely blows my mind. There was an absolute miracle that happened. That's why that's the, the you know the lighting of the candles there in Hanukkah. It reminds them of what God did for them as a people, as Jews, that He saved them from this guy Antiochus Epiphanes. That He used uh, Judah to wipe these guys out to get them out of the land, and that they restored true worship to the land. It's absolutely absolutely amazing. And guys, this festival is even recorded in the New Testament. You think, oh, Hanukkah is not recorded in the Bible. It is recorded in the Bible. You can look. John chapter 10, verse 22. What does it say? At the time of the feast of dedication or rededication, which took place at Jerusalem and what it was? Winter. The only festival that happens during winter for the Jews would be the festival of Hanukkah. And so we know this festival of dedication. Jesus was in Jerusalem for at least one of these festivals of dedication. It absolutely blows my mind. Something that is going on today has its roots here in Daniel chapter 8 with this prophecy of this gentleman Antiochus. 
and what he was going to do to the nation. And now we see, like, Daniel's looking forward, and he's saying, man, this Antiochus, this little horn is going to come, you know, and remember, in Daniel chapter 7, he talked about the little horn who was the Antichrist, and so he's trying to sit here and figure this out, like, what, this is a little different. Why is this little horn different from the little horn uh, in the previous chapter, in Daniel chapter 7? What's going on? And so he's looking at this, and he doesn't understand this prophecy. And that's not surprising, because without an interpretation, none of us would understand these prophecies. And so we understand being able to see the interpretation of the prophecy and looking back on the past events, we understand exactly what happened. And yet here, Gabriel is going to come and Gabriel is going to give the interpretation to Daniel. And what does he say? He says, he says this, when I, Daniel, when I, Daniel had seen the vision, I sought to understand it. I didn't know what was going on. And behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called Gabriel. Make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood. And when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time of the end. And when he had spoke to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. He said, behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. Again, Daniel doesn't understand. What does Gabriel say? The vision is for, did you read it right there in verse 17? The vision is for the time of the end. He also repeats it in verse 19. He says, the latter end of the indignation, it refers to the appointed time of the end. Three times he says this. He's What he is saying is that There is going to be a double fulfillment of this prophecy. There is going to be someone that comes out of this Greek line, and we know him as he's up there, Antiochus. He's going to come out of this Greek line, but he will be an absolute picture of this man that's going to come in the last days. There's going to be a man that's going to come in the last days. He will be an absolute picture of this man, the Antichrist, to come in the last days. And so there will be a near fulfillment of Antiochus, but there will also be a far fulfillment with the Antichrist that's going to come against Israel and against the world in the last days. And so now he gets into the interpretation. What does he say? As for the ram, we've talked about this, that you saw with the two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia, one of them being strong stronger than the other, Persia being stronger than the Medes. And the goat is the king of Greece. And the great horn between his eyes is the first king, Alexander the Great. And as for the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. There's going to be four kingdoms that come up. And out of one of these kingdoms, there's going to come this gentleman, Antiochus, who's going to be a picture of the Antichrist. And the parallels, we're going to look through this. The parallels are absolutely amazing between this gentleman, Antiochus, of history for us and the Antichrist of the future for us. The parallels between these two guys are absolutely amazing. So let's walk through it together. Verse 23, what does it say? It says, And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king, a king of bold face shall arise. So we've got this king that's going to come. And so there's 11 things that we're going to go through this morning. There's 11 things that are both of Antiochus, but are also a picture of the Antichrist. Both of these gentlemen are going to have this idea of a bold face. What does that mean? The idea of a bold face? Well, obviously you might say, Eli, let's not be silly. That's somebody who's bold. (laughs) Somebody who is bold is somebody who has a bold face. But what is it to be bold? I mean, we see Christ. Christ walked in humility. And so we know this idea of boldness is the opposite of Jesus Christ, who was the, the, (laughs) he was humble. And so the idea of this boldness is the idea of pride, that they follow in the footsteps of Satan, the one who initiated pride. The very first sin that ever happened uh, was Satan, was the sin of Satan. And we know the sin of Satan. 
It's not like we don't know. We all know the sin of Satan. And so these two gentlemen, both Antiochus and the future Antichrist, are going to be bold. They're going to be full of pride. They're going to be following their father Satan. And what is the sin of Satan? If you remember the sin of Satan, it's found in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14. And we call this, in Christianity, we call this the five I wills of Satan. Here he is. He was the anointed cherub that covered. He was there. He was pretty much supreme, the supreme of the creation. And what does he say? This is God saying to him, you said in your heart, the day that iniquity was found in Satan, you said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will be the best. I I will set my throne on high. People will worship me. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will be God. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. Here we have Satan and all of his pride wanting to be God. And what what happens to Satan? He's cast down. He was a bold face. And it makes perfect sense that the people that follow him, that are empowered by him, will also be of bold face. And so we see both Antiochus and the Antichrist are going to have this bold face. They're going to follow their father, Satan. They are going to be ones that say, we will be God. We will be worshipped as God. And what we know, church, is that they are absolutely marked by pride. And the second thing in verse 23, what does it say? One who understands riddles shall arise. So we have the first thing, the bold face. The second thing is this understanding of riddles. Well, what does that mean, this understanding of riddles? Remember, interpret scripture by scripture. Go back. What is it? Daniel chapter 4. And look at when Belshazzar, the writing is on the wall. What does the queen mother say of Daniel? Here's one that understands riddles. And so we know who empowered Daniel. It was Jesus Christ that empowered Daniel to understand the riddles, to understand the things that were going on. It's quite possibly why he found himself in Susa because the Babylonians understood we need to send somebody over there who's going to be able to be our diplomatic ambassador to these Medes and Persians because we're probably going to have a fight with them at some point. And so who do they send? Well, they send Daniel over there to these Medes and Persians. And while Daniel's with the Medes and Persians, God is telling him, don't even worry about this, Daniel. The Medes and Persians are going to take over. Don't, whatever your diplomatic mission is, the Medes and Persians are eventually going to take over. Because Daniel could understand. The Lord had allowed him to understand. And so here we see that these two men, Antiochus and both the future Antichrist, are going to be empowered by the enemy. That they're going to understand the things that are going on in the times. That they're going to have brilliant plans. People are going to think, man, these plans that you have are absolutely great plans. But they're not. In, they're going to be empowered by Satan. Notice the very next, the very next verse, verse twenty-four. It, it shows us. It says, "His power shall be great, but not by his own power." We see the very first thing here, and that's the, the third thing. It's not by his own power. That both Antiochus was empowered by the demonic, just as the Antichrist is absolutely going to be empowered by Satan. The Antichrist will be empowered by Satan. And not only that, what is the next thing in this verse? Uh, It says, and he shall cause fearful destruction. Causing fearful destruction. Both the Antichrist and Antiochus would claim to be men of peace. And yet both of them would go to war. We see that the Antichrist, even at the beginning, where we learned last week that he takes out three of the ten kings right at the very beginning of his rule because they won't follow him, that we think that these men are going to be men of peace. They are not going to be men of peace. They are going to be men of war, causing fearful destruction. The next thing, and shall succeed in what he does. Both Antiochus, for a time, succeeded in what he did. The Antichrist We read it last week. For a time, for seven years, he will succeed in what he does. And yet we must remember, what did we learn last week? The courts of God were opening. They were beginning to become in session as the Antichrist was succeeding for a time. The courts of God are always going to be open. People will think that they have success here on earth, but the Lord knows that his court is open and they are headed for one thing. They are headed for destruction. And number six, they will destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. 
And this is very specific. It's saying that both of these gentlemen will have an absolute hatred and attempt to destroy Israel. Both of them. We saw it with Antiochus. He came into Jerusalem. He slaughtered, I want to say 80,000, I think I read. Jews in one day as he came came and just started to wipe out Jerusalem. We're going to see the very same thing happen three and a half years into the tribulation with the Antichrist that he is going to come and he's going to say, worship me or be killed. And man, the Jews are going to start fleeing and he's going to start slaughtering them because he really hates the Jews. One of the ideas with both Antiochus and the Antichrist is that they will be men who will hate, absolutely hate Israel. Number seven, by his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. Both of these men will be very deceitful. They will deceive many. And and we know from the future that the Antichrist is going to deceive a bunch of people. The entire world will be deceived by the Antichrist. They will think that he is something absolutely amazing, and he is absolutely not. Without warning, he shall... Did I miss one? Yes, I did. And in his own mind, he shall become great. They're both going to claim to be God. They're both going to claim that they should... Antiochus Epiphanes, the revelation manifested, you know, and the Antichrist, they're both going to claim to be God. They're both going to set up their their images in the temple. They're both going to demand worship or be killed in their own minds. They are something absolutely amazing. The delusions of grandeur. They're going to be allowed to succeed for a time. Without warning, he shall destroy many. Again, speaking about the destruction of the Jews. That they're both going to go into Jerusalem. They're both going to, they both, you know, Antiochus in the past, Antichrist in the future, setting up these idols setting up themselves to be worshipped, and then destroying people that will not follow them. They're absolutely going to destroy them. And, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, that they are going to challenge God by their own saying that we are God. They're challenging God, saying, you're not God. You're not God. I am God. They rise up against God. And here is the great news. And he shall be broken but by no human hand. Antiochus, as he's fleeing, it's, it's a sad end to his story. As he's fleeing, he goes to give a speech one day as he's fleeing out of Jerusalem, out of Israel, and he's taken by, I think it's in the Maccabees, talks about it, he's taken by a pain in his abdomen, and he dies in absolute agony after fleeing to Rome. No human touches him. God strikes him dead. And it's the same with the Antichrist. We know at the end of the tribulation, what? The Antichrist, he's going to rise up against the prince of princes. He's going to rise up against God at the end of the tribulation. And what is he going to do? He's going to get all the armies that are left in the world. They're going to go to this place of Armageddon. They're going to challenge God to a fight. They're going to say, fight us. God, if you're real, fight us. And the Lord is going to come. And there's all the saints are going to be there. And we're just going to watch. We're just going to be like watching. And it says that the Lord is going to trod the winepress of his wrath. He's going to go down and he's going to stomp on the armies like a wine, like you would stomp in a wine press. And you know, with all the grapes in the wine press, and you, you just stomp on them to get the to get the, the juice to come out. That's a wine press. And so God is going to just come down there and just stomp on all the armies of the world. It's, This guy will be destroyed, but not by human hands. Why? Because Jesus himself is going to come down and stomp on him. We're just going to watch and be like, okay, there goes the Lord, you know, stomping on the armies of the world that want to fight against him. And they're going to get a fight and they're going to be utterly destroyed. They will be broken, but by no human hand. Oh my goodness. All of these, there's 11 things here. These are the things that Antiochus has done in our past. 171 to to 165 BC. We saw these things. And yet here Gabriel is saying all of these things. This man Antiochus is a picture for you 
of what is going to happen in the future. Learn from the past so you can be prepared for this man that's going to come in the future. This absolute madman that's going to take the world by deceit and is going to absolutely claim to be a man of peace. And yet, what is he going to do? He's going to be a man of utter war. He is going to set up a, he's going to set up a treaty with Israel for seven years. The temple will be rebuilt and then he will demand to be worshipped as God. And you take the mark to worship him or you will be killed. Just like Antiochus said, you want to worship God? I will kill you if you try to worship God. You worship me. It is absolutely crazy, this picture of the Antichrist that we have in the history of our world. That this the Antichrist will be like this guy. And so what do we do? Verse 26, I love verse 26. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. This is how long this guy is going to rule for. Just like with us, we know how long the tribulation is going to last for. We're going to see that next week. The tribulation is going to last for seven years. The visions is true, but seal up the vision for it refers again to many days from now. The prophecy of both Antiochus and the prophecy of the Antichrist are true. One has already happened. And what is yet to happen in the future, we can be sure of it. And so this idea of sealing up the vision, because it's for the end times, that it's for the people of the, the idea of sealing up the vision is not to hide the vision. People think, oh, we got to hide. No, the idea of sealing up the vision is to make sure that, Daniel, you write this vision down, you record this vision so that the people in the future can have absolute confidence in what is going to happen that the people of the future will have seen Antiochus and they'll know one like Antiochus is coming the Antichrist is coming and so how do we respond to the to this prophecy how do we respond to what will happen in the world I love how Daniel responds notice the conclusion with me together verse 27 and I Daniel was Overcome, I lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. Church, Daniel had the interpretation. Notice what it says. He was overcome. He lay sick. He was appalled. He did not understand it. That was Daniel. He was overcome. He lay sick. He did not understand the things that were going on. But what did he do? But I rose and went about the king's business. I went and I did what the king, what my king had commanded me to do. I went about the king's business. In church, we must do the same. Why? We're living in the last days. We see, we, we've seen Antiochus of the past, and we know that there will be an Antiochus, an Antichrist of the future. The plane, as we say, is going down. We're living in the last days. We must be about our captain's business. And who is our captain? You learn in Hebrews, he is the archegos. He is the captain. He is the pioneer. He is blazing a trail for us. We must have a love and concern. There are people today church. There are people today who do not know the Lord. The plane is going down. It's our jobs not to run around and sit there and say, oh my goodness, hey, oh, we're going crazy. The plane is going down. Run for your life. No. Our job is to sit there and say, brace. Be ready. Are you ready for the return of our Lord? Are you ready for Christ's return? The enemy is coming. The Antichrist is coming. We know this for a fact. Are you ready for the return of Christ? God's put someone into your life for you to witness to, for you to be God's ambassador to. The only question remains is, are you going to be faithful? Do not be a stumbling block. Don't be sitting there, you know, going crazy about things that in the long run do not matter. Prophecy is here to encourage us to point people to the Lord. Let's be faithful ambassadors of Christ. Let's point a lost and hurting world to Jesus Christ. Church, we must be faithful. Going back to our first verse, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, we must be faithful as stewards to point others to Jesus Christ. We know that we are all sinners, that this every one of us is sinful. I'm a sinful man. You're a sinful man, a sinful woman. And yet God saved us. 
God died on the cross for our sins. He paid the price. He paid the penalty. He fulfilled the law in that he kept it and he paid the price for you. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Trust the Lord. That he died on the cross for your sins. Romans 5, 8 says very clearly, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That God demonstrates love. That he died on the cross for our sins. And that, guys, this is nothing but good news. That God showed you how much he loved you by dying for you. By dying for your sins. And he's calling you today. Would you believe in him? This is available for anyone. Anyone. Yet to those who receive him. To those who believe in his name. He gives them the right to become children of God. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord, I I need to tell you, danger is ahead. This world is coming to a close. We're looking out and we have prophecy and prophecy is telling us that that last week of Daniel is rapidly approaching. We see Jesus talking in Matthew 24, the events of the future. We see Paul talking in, in 2 Timothy, talking about the characteristics of the future. And we look around and we see these very events happening all around us today. And we know the end is coming. I have absolute confidence in God and his word. And I want to share with you this morning. If you don't know the Lord, there's there's no hope. And yet for those of us that know the Lord, we have absolute hope. Because our captain has blazed a trail. He blazed a trail through suffering that leads to glory. And I want to encourage you this morning. Come to the Lord. If the Lord is knocking on the door of your heart this morning, I want to encourage you, come to the Lord. Maybe you're here watching online and you've never received the Lord as your Savior. And you can feel Him. That's the Spirit knocking on the door of your life. I want to encourage you this morning, come to the Lord. Respond to Him. Uh, One of my good friends, Jason Simpson, would always say, you need to do business with God. You need to be the one that says, Lord, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. I am a sinful woman. I believe that you died on the cross, that you paid the price for my sin, that you fulfilled the law. And I'll follow you wherever you go. You be my captain. What a man, you pray a prayer like that. If you don't know the Lord, you pray a prayer like that. You trust the Lord. Reach out to us. Talk to us. We want to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. But as we follow the Lord, as we have a foundation on Jesus Christ, he is our captain. And we will follow him like those flight attendants. When the captain said, brace for impact, we will follow him wherever he goes. Brace for impact. We're going to follow him because he is the captain. We're going to trust in him. We must be about our captain's business. And so I want to encourage you this morning, have confidence in God, have a passion for his word, grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, pray and point others to him and patiently wait, patiently wait for God and his plan and timing. And so Father God, we do thank you for this morning. We thank you for your word. Lord, that you do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We pray, Lord, this morning that you would work in us. Lord, if there's somebody here watching online that doesn't know you, we pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, we pray that as we know what's going to happen, as we have named you as our captain, the captain of our ship, Lord, we pray that we would be like those flight attendants, that those stewards on that plane that would have absolute confidence and trust in you, that we would trust you when you tell us what to do and that we would walk it out in obedience. And so go before us today, Lord. Lord, be our Archegos. Lord, be the captain of our salvation. Lord, help us to be your ambassadors. Help us not to be running around, focusing on things that are unimportant. But Lord, that one person that you've put into our lives, maybe it's in our family, maybe it's with our friends, maybe it's someone with our coworkers. We ask that you would you would give us the words to say, that you would fill us with your spirit, that we would use our testimony to point them to you. And so Lord, we thank you for prophecy, that we can see the events, the history before it even happens. We can have confidence in you. So go before us. We love you. We commit these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a great Sunday. We're going to have the girls come up and do one last song this morning. And...
Let's worship together. We will see you guys. We will see you guys tomorrow, 10 a.m. If not, we will see you on Tuesday or Wednesday, or we'll see you next Sunday, hopefully on the property. God bless. Have a great Sunday. All right. Um, let's just do ever 